Welcome to the Remembering a Life podcast. I'm your host, Holly Ignatowski, and today we're talking with John Carmen, a funeral director and president of Carmen Community Funeral Homes in Connecticut. Following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, John spent three weeks in New York City and in the months that followed made approximately 15 trips back to the city to work with families and assist city officials in the recovery efforts. At the time, John was president of the National Funeral Directors Association, the world's largest funeral service association, which provides support to funeral directors around the world. Welcome, John, and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Holly, and thank you for for doing this. Hard to believe we're looking at the 20th anniversary of that terrible day on September 11, 2001. Can you tell us about that morning and how your day began? Actually, I should tell you about the day before, um, because I was in Washington, D.C., representing NFDA. Um, It had been a year since the association had worked with the federal agencies and got the government to agree that they would provide military honors to any veteran who died and provide two members of the service that they were part of to fold the flag, present it to the family, and play taps. And they had asked me to come where they had VSOs and representatives from all the different branches of the service to speak about the significance of what this had meant to so many families in this in that past year. So that afternoon, I spoke to over 450 people that were gathered for that, and then afterwards made a few visits to some of the congressional representatives that had helped us make this legislation possible, and then actually took the last flight out of Washington, D.C. that night at, at 9 o'clock to, um, to come home. And the next morning was in the office, uh, in my office at um, 7.30 in the morning when, of course, we all got word of, you know, of, of what had happened in, in New York City. When you first learned that the World Trade Center had been hit by a plane and we were looking at uh, a tragedy, did you have an inkling that you'd be making a trip to New York City? I, I right at that point, no. Um, the... Um, that then when word came out of the plane and what it was, um, my daughter-in-law's father was a, a pilot who normally was flying that plane. And so, of course, the concern I had and later found out that someone had taken his place earlier. Um, so there, I mean, many emotions. Because of the significance of this, I gathered all our staff at the funeral home for, um, excuse me, for prayer and just to talk with them and told them that, you know, that they were free to go home to their families and children um, if they, um, if they had young young folks at home and everything that hopefully were going to be brought back from school. This is still obviously very emotional for you, and it it hit you very hard. You know, and you're in a business where you're dealing with grief and and sorrow every day, but this was was on a, a scale we'd never seen before in this country. Tell us about when you arrived in New York City and what was your specific role there? NFDA had been working with a, um, a public relations company, and they knew that there would be a lot that we could do to provide, you know, both assistance and information. And there were many forums where, you know, people would be asked for information, you know, expert witnesses, things like that. And so we went there to do that in the in the very beginning and um it was it was obviously extremely emotional one of the sessions that i remember the most was we were gathered in a um in a studio and there were about 60 of us representing all 
just all walks of life. Um, I remember one of the fire chief's son, who the fire chief had not been found yet, and his son was there holding his dad's helmet, and there were members of the clergy. I remember sitting next to a rabbi. There were teachers, and they also web streamed in a, um, you know, some, in fact, I remember um, Senator McCain, um, he was webbed in, and, you know, so we had interactive discussions about all of this and everything that was going on. And uh, I remember talking specifically, um, we have a full-time center for grieving children and families called Mary's Place. So we're particularly sensitive to the needs of young children, especially those between three through teen years. And so we were, we had some discussion about, you know, this effect on children and, you know, how parents could talk with children and what kinds of things that, you know, that they could do to help them to work through this. Often children are thought of as the forgotten grievers and because they appear to go about their their normal activities and play and do other things but sometimes are you know quiet about their feelings and um how they might be able to to draw them out and and you know make sure that they um they express themselves John what was your reaction upon seeing ground zero for the first time were you prepared for that I don't know if anyone could be adequately prepared for that. I remember just the enormity of it. I remember being with the head of DMORT as he guided me through and explained the different things and what was being done. I remember just wanting to drop down on one knee and and to pray at that spot for all these people and people that still had not been found or people who had not been recovered and and just wanting to touch the ground and the significance and the enormity of that i mean it's um it was it was just a a very emotional very emotional experience. I had the chance as well to bring Rabbi Earl Goldman, who had spent years working with children in grief, and Earl wanted to um, come down and see if there was any help that he could provide. And so I brought Earl to New York and introduced him to everyone and some of the folks that were providing counseling and everything else, if there was some way that he could provide materials or other things that would particularly help with children. And I can remember Earl just, 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 just tears flowing um, that, um, you know, with, with what was, you know, what you were experiencing and feeling. So you were there as an expert in the funeral profession, and I understand you did quite a number of media interviews. Um, you coordinated funeral director volunteers. You also had informal interactions with people, creating something you called honor rituals. Can you explain what that was? Yes. Um, one of the things that happened was that there were so many people that knew nothing. You know, there was no word. They didn't know about their their relatives, their friends, their husbands, wives, or, you know, or people that were in the trade center and what had happened to them. And so they would post their photographs on the wall of the medical examiner's office down on 2nd Avenue in, um, in Manhattan. And then they would go back and visit those pictures to see if anyone left a message that they had heard of anyone or seen anyone, you know, because families were, were separated and, you know, they just didn't know where they were. So at, at that, sometimes you'd begin to talk with people there and all of a sudden a crowd would gather. And I can remember talking to, you know, a small family unit, and then all of a sudden three or four more people would come, and then a few more people would come, 
and pretty soon there was 35 people on the on the sidewalk all gathered and as i explained to one family how they could create a ritual at home or around their dining room table and you know to light a candle and maybe hold hands and um either just share remembrances or pray together if 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 that was their tradition to just do something that brought structure to to this this event because it was so catastrophic and people just just didn't understand and there was so little information that was available so important at a time where people feel out of control and so helpless i would imagine and i understand that you also helped provide honors for one of the service dogs who was killed that day how did that come about well this was um several weeks after the beginning you know when it occurred but i was there at the medical examiner's office and um, we had coordinated help for them to help in, in, in their recovery efforts and also documentation. And we had volunteers there for two weeks at a time and in visiting them and some of the DMORT folks while we were there, we got word that they had discovered a service dog that had died and that they had notified the handler and um, police officer. And this dog had been with him, as I remember, for six or seven years. So they were very close. And he arrived, and the, um, the ambulance that would um, bring the, the service dog to the medical examiner's office from ground zero was escorted by... New York City Police Department, motorcycles um, and cruisers, just as anyone that they discovered and brought to the medical examiner's office. And the, the dog had been draped with the American flag. And after bringing the dog out of the ambulance, I was asked to fold and present the flag with one of the DMORT volunteers to the dog's handler. And um, that was a it was an emotional event, and very much so for um, for the police officer who had lost, you know, like a member of his own family. Mm, that's beautiful. I can imagine. You know what a lovely final gift for not only the dog but his handler. So day in and day out, you are helping these families on a much larger scale than you than you normally do in your in your everyday profession. It's got to take a toll, even for someone, you know, as, as experienced as you. You had to be strong for these families, but we were all grieving. Everyone was grieving. You were grieving. How, how did you remain strong? Where did your strength come from? Well, from my faith, um, I, have, I have a very strong faith, and um, as a strong Christian, I, um, I would rely on that and would pray daily and... Uh, and pray with families that um, that wish that. The other thing that was very important was that we were still serving families every day who were having, and how do you say this, a normal death. You know, their mother, dad, husband, wife um, died after having a heart attack or sickness or something else, and yet those deaths were still extremely significant for their families. And yet with what was going on in the country and with everyone grieving the loss of so many people at the Trade Center and so many first responders and everything else, you had to make sure that, that, that our staff and all of us still treated w with the importance and the significance of these people that were experiencing, you know, normal deaths in their family. And so that was very important because sometimes people would even say, well, you know, gosh, you know, with what other people are experiencing, you know, our, our loss is, is not that significant. And I mean, people would say that. And we had to make sure that they felt that that was not the case. 
that they had to receive the same care and and detail and everything with what they needed to not only celebrate that life and honor the person that died, but also to validate you know, their feelings of loss. Every loss is significant, no matter what scale. And so many of the funeral directors who came out there, they volunteered their time. They took vacation from work without hesitation. They just traveled from probably, you know, across the country to help out. What does it mean to you to be a part of a profession that gives so selflessly to others in in times like tragedy? I was so proud of our profession. You know, serving as the president of the National Funeral Directors Association at the time, I got phone calls from literally all over the United States. How can I help? Um, what can I do? And, and hundreds of people just wanted to give of their time. And so we were able, um, with the help of the association executives, to be able to work out something with the medical examiner of how we could help them so that it would be significant. And, you know, it required that two-week minimum stay. And the association, who had received donations from around the country, was able to use those funds to provide the housing for these volunteers so that they had a place to stay. And there were so many agencies there the um, Salvation Army, the Red Cross, and among among many others who provided meals and everything else. So meals were never a, never an issue. These people were true volunteers. I think the only maybe other real volunteer were the cheerleaders, which was a group of people who every every day, every hour of every day, They just came as volunteers from all over the city and stood in the median of the um, of the road where everyone would would leave ground zero when they had either finished their shifts or their time there and everything else. And and they would just clap and cheer for them just to thank them for being there. And um, that was that was a very significant group of people that I, I'll never forget. And in several presentations that I made at, you know, 9-11 observances and even several years following that, I would tell the story of, of these cheerleaders because they were like blessings from God just because they were there out of the goodness of their heart to just say thank you to all these people without any thanks themselves or no schedule, no, you know, they weren't on anything. They just showed up to do this 24 hours a day for months. Hmm, a bright spot in a very dark time. It was. It was, it was, it was as if God was reaching down to tell these workers that it's going to be all right. Hmm. As you look back on these past 20 years, what memories stayed with you the most? Are there, are there families that you still think about? Yes, but you know, it's, it's like when something is so fresh and raw, sometimes that it looks so, so terrible. I mean, everything is so terrible. And then after time, and you seem to look at it from a distance, it's like even at the time looking at the New York skyline with the clouds of smoke that went on for weeks, um, you know, after the collapse of these, of the towers and and everything, how how terrible and, and how awful that was. And now as you look at the New York skyline and look at it from a distance, it seems though it's peaceful, it's beautiful. It's, it's, and it's changed just like time has helped to change. And while 
many people are still terribly grieving that event and the loss that they have had that hopefully that time gives you a different perspective to to be able to see it in in a in a healing way or a way that that there's been some healing does that make sense makes perfect sense john i ask all of my guests this who are you remembering today well um you know there are there are several families that we um served who lived in our area even though we were were up in Hartford County and Tolland County and in Connecticut but there were people that used to travel and work in the in the trade center you know i never forget those people and also relatives of uh, friends that are have been friends for years um, in one case, was a sister, and um, so we always remember her. But um, you know, every again, every death is significant, and as many people do when they have a loss in their own family, go back and think of some of these other tragedies. We were very involved in the terrible um, shootings at Sandy Hook in um, Newtown, Connecticut with the children and we cared for the children um, at our facility and and helped the funeral directors that were there providing the services and any of those tragedies um, just they just bring back that whole raft of emotions and and feelings that um, you know that are so significant and as funeral directors, just because we do this every day, and I've been a funeral director for 53 years and grew up in a funeral home as a child, living over the second floor, you, you, never, you never get hardened to people's loss and the families that you're caring for and what they're going through. Um, I think the day that I do is the day that I need to retire. Thank you so much for joining me today, John, and for sharing your stories and your compassion and your beautiful heart. And on behalf of your country, thank you for everything you and your funeral service colleagues have done to help families, communities, the nation, for helping us heal in the last 20 years. Your work is invaluable. Thank you. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think funeral service, if it's, if it's done with care and compassion, can provide communities ways that they can deal with many losses, uh, not just death, but that where they can teach communities to come together, to support one another, to show love and understanding. Um, that's the importance and what sets us apart and, and our society here that we care about other people and we need to show them that care and compassion. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you for joining me today. To share your own memories and reflections about the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, visit rememberingalife.com slash share your story.